Hi everyone, welcome to Things Lucy Reads. I'm Luce and this is my April reading wrap up. So in the month of April I read six books. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is not the first one I read but it's the only one I can't show you because I read it as an ebook. It is Little Free Library by Naomi Kritzer which is a tour short so you can read it for free on their website. I will link that down below. So this is about a woman who sets up a little free library. If you don't know what that is it's essentially a book swap. It's a little like cupboard that is outside somewhere. Sometimes they're inside but mostly they're outside and you just put books in that you no longer want and then people can come along and put in books that they no longer want and take a book if there's one there that they want to have. It's just a little book swap. You Sometimes uh, shopping centres do it, sometimes people do it individually. That's the premise of a, of a little free library. So in this story, <laughs> let's get back on point. This woman starts up a little free library and uh, puts a lot of books in there and then comes back to find that all of the books have been taken. And so she puts some more in there and she writes a note saying really appreciate that you're enjoying the books. Please don't take them all at once. Leave them for other people. Please only take one at a time. And then whoever took the books starts leaving her notes back. Eventually you find out more and more about this person and what they're using the books for and it was just kind of really zany and really funny. I gave it three stars. Like it was fun but I'm in in another month I'll probably will have forgotten about it entirely. It's worth however long it takes to read it because it, I thought it was pretty funny. And then I read two books that I have been planning to read at Easter for years and years and years. I actually made a vlog the year I first attempted to read these, which was back at the beginning of COVID times. I will link it up here. I did not read these books in that vlog, spoiler alert. But I finally read them this year. So the first one is E. Aster Bunnymund and the Warrior Eggs at the Earth's Core by William Joyce, which is book two of the Guardians of Childhood series. This series are the books that the movie Rise of the Guardians is based on, but they are radically, radically different from that film. And uh, this was cute. It was fairly enjoyable. I gave it three stars. I don't recommend starting with the second in the series. The first one is about Nicholas St. North, who is like Santa. It probably would have been better to have read that first because I would have had a better understanding of how this world actually works because I couldn't just go in with my knowledge of the film and understand this world because they are different. Ultimately, the thing that ruined this for me, which... The author obviously just intended it to be a cute joke and a child might read it that way but an adult probably should have known better than to than to do it. So this book obviously is about the Easter Bunny character and in order to find him North and Catherine go to Easter Island and they get there and all there's all of these head statues obviously easter island heads and they have bunny ears and it mentions that no one lives there and the thing about and okay yeah that's a funny joke the easter bunny is from easter island ha 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 makes sense cute except that easter island is the colonizer's name for this island which is actually called rapa nui and it is inhabited by humans and these heads which are indigenous relics do not have bunny ears and it just really rubbed me the wrong way that essentially William Joyce erased actual history in order to make a joke about the Easter Bunny being from Easter Island which is not what that island is called by the people that live there and then also he said it was uninhabited by humans, which is patently false. So I just, eh. Anyway, and then the next book that I read is Chocolat by Joanne Harris. Uh, this was a very interesting reading experience. I ended up giving this one three and a half. The thing about this book is that the movie is a very close, very faithful adaptation, except all of the characters and all of the character dynamics are completely different than they are in the book. Obviously there's Anouk and Vianne, they're the same, Armand is the same, Reynaud and Caroline are in it, and Guillaume, he's in it too, but, and, and, and Rue, <laughs> but everything is completely different. 
There are so many things that I love about the movie that completely aren't present in this book because all of the characters are just so completely different. So in the movie, uh, Reno is the mayor of the town. He's a count and he has this kind of really slow burn, like reluctant but for no good reason romance with Caroline, who is the daughter of Armand. And I really loved that part of the movie. And then the character Guillaume has this sort of late in life romance with a woman called the Widow Odell. That's not in the book because the Widow Odell doesn't exist. The relationship between Vianne and Rue is different in the movie than it is in the book. Not, not massively, except also yes, massively. And I can't tell you how without spoiling it. Um, also Josephine is in the book and that's the same as it is in the movie, more or less. And I just, all, all of these things that I loved about the film, so like these relationships and the, the priest being kind of young, kind of inexperienced, not really equipped to deal with everything that's happening and kind of under the thumb of the mayor of the town. He's not in the book because in the book, Reno is the priest and he's a terrible person. And so it just, at, at the same time, I knew the story and I knew what was going to happen and, you know, Armand has diabetes and she doesn't get to see her grandson, except that Vianne makes it so she can. The travelling around, all of that kind of thing, that was all the same, except it was a completely different thing than the film because the characters were so different. And Carolyn, especially in the book, she's very shallow and vapid. And I think that's the crux of it, is that in this book, all of the characters are essentially two-dimensional village archetypes, whereas the movie turns them into three-dimensional human beings with a full range of emotions and kind of allows them to be messy in a way that isn't just black and white and like lets them be imperfect human beings as opposed to just these set archetypes. This is the first in a series. I don't know if I'm going to read on because I, I've read some reviews from my friends and I think if I did read on it might ruin the feelings that I have about this book, which is that I really, really enjoyed it, but I ultimately did enjoy the movie more just because I liked the characters and all of their dynamics in the movie more than in the book. But I still really did enjoy this and I there's there's certain things I think would be spoiled if I read on because the characters change and do things that I think I wouldn't like. So I really enjoyed reading it, uh, but I think if if you've seen the movie first and you really, really like the movie and then you're going into reading this, just be prepared for it to be completely different while also exactly the same, which was a very strange experience, but yeah. Also, I will link my story graph review for this because the content warnings for this book are no joke for all that it is a fun book about belonging and chocolate it's also pretty heavy with the religious bigotry and the racism and the domestic abuse which if you've seen the movie you will know you know it's there's some heavy shit in here but ultimately the book was really enjoyable really liked it um, it's just so different than <laughs> than the film but i think they complement each other ultimately like it's not that oh, the movie is better and this is a, a, a failing of the book. It's just that the book does a completely different thing with the characters than the movie does. And they, they, they stand equally doing and accomplishing completely different things. The next book that I read is Hometown Haunts, which was edited by Poppy Noisu. This is a anthology of short stories, short horror stories by Australian authors. Some of these I really, really loved. Uh, Vicky Wakefield's was a standout for me. Um, Oh, pretty serious animal cruelty in that one, but I really enjoyed it. Uh, Alison Evans's story I also really loved, unsurprisingly. And I would have really loved Jared Thomas's story, except that it had some completely unnecessary, like, egregious fat phobia in there. There was one fat character, and their entire purpose in the story was to, first of all, do disgusting farts, and second of all, be a scaredy cat didn't need to be fat to do either of those things, but he was fat and we were explicitly told that he was very fat. So apart from that, the story, his story was really good. I ultimately gave this collection a 3.75. For about half of the stories, I feel like the authors conflated horror with violence. And I know that slashes are a legitimate genre of horror stories, 
but I don't enjoy them and I like the hills have eyes is absolutely not my jam I like more of a psychological thriller I want to be like viscerally terrified and not just grossed out by blood and guts so like like I didn't even really like Midsummer because I didn't expect it to be so violent and I don't think that violence is scary. I think that there are other things that are much, much more scary than violence. And a, and a lot of the stories in this book were just violent. So those ones fell kind of flat for me. And unfortunately it was like half of the collection, but the ones that were good in here were really, really good. And it did give me a taste of some authors that I'm hoping to try again later. So, bit of a hit and miss, but there were some stories in here that I really, really enjoyed. And ultimately, I think if you like slasher films you'll be fine with it I just really really don't so didn't really hit the mark for me for the most part and then the next book that I read was a poetry collection I gave this one four stars it is How Decent Folk Behave by Maxine Benneber Clark which is a collection of poems based on current events like um, police brutality the fires and floods and other massive weather events that we're seeing all around the world because of climate change uh, ineffectiveness of the government, uh, the Women's March, Black Lives Matter marches, really, really like searing commentary on the things that have been happening for the last few years. And it was just genuinely incredible. And I have some other books by Maxine Benneber Clark and now I'm really excited to get to them because she's just every bit as incredible as I expected she would be. So if you can pick this up, I definitely recommend it. Got one more book, but it is A Wizard of Earthsea by Ursula K. Le Guin which is the story of this boy called Sparrowhawk. That's not his true name, but that's the name that everyone uses for him. And he has magical abilities and he is kind of discovered by the resident wizard of the island where he lives and is taken in as an apprentice and kind of beginning to be taught magic. And his master says to him, I can teach you what you need, but I cannot make you a great wizard. If you go to this wizarding school, you'll become a great wizard, but it will also, you know, has the potential for disaster, but it's up to you. And Sparrowhawk chooses to go to the school and he is a brilliant student, like tremendous powers, like really good at all of the classes, generally enjoys it, but he starts up this rivalry with this other boy, which culminates in a duel in which Sparrowhawk summons from the land of the dead a shadow which he can never be rid of and in saving him from this shadow to begin with the archmage of the entire country sacrifices his life to save Sparrowhawks. So obviously then Sparrowhawk completely changes in personality, stops being so cocky and proud of his abilities which got him into the trouble in the first place and then the story is about him kind of finishing his schooling and going off out into the world and grappling with the fact that he has caused this problem for himself and it's going to bring danger not just for him but for anyone he's close to and he has to deal with it if he wants to live any kind of life. And so the book is about him journeying from place to place, at first outrunning the shadow and then kind of growing up and confronting it. it is a meditation on fixing your own problems, taking responsibility for your actions, growing as a person in the face of your own failure and facilitating your own character growth. And I read this book because I was so angry at Dune and the way that it's constantly excused for its bad behavior because it's a product of its time. Dune came out in 1965 and A Wizard of Earthsea came out in 1968. But the point about Ursula K. Le Guin is that the, A Wizard of Earthsea is not her first book. She was publishing science fiction far before she ever wrote this. So essentially Frank Herbert and Ursula K. Le Guin were writing in the same time. Both of these books are a product of their time. And in Dune, we have a singular fat character who is the villain. And we are told that he is fat all the fucking time. He's so fat, he can't even carry his own weight around. And in addition to that, he's a pedophile and he exclusively sleeps with boys. And he pretty much also exclusively only sleeps with boys who remind him of his nephew and his grandson. In Earthsea, we have a fat character called Vetch. He's black and he's Sparrowhawk's first friend at magic school and remains a true friend 
throughout Sparrowhawk's whole life, goes with him during the final confrontation of the, sh of the Shadow, and is all round just a really good, trustworthy, reliable guy. And pretty much all of the inhabitants of Earthsea, not just Vetch, but also Sparrowhawk, are various shades of brown or black. And it's the ones that are untrustworthy or deceitful who are explicitly described as white. And so, like, the fat phobia and racism in Dune is completely not present in A Wizard of Earthsea. And they're both written in the same time. So the point I'm trying to make here is calling a book a product of its time doesn't excuse it for anything. And it's... A lazy thing to say and it, and it throws under the bus every single other author who was writing at that same time it's like if someone 50 years in the future says oh jk rowling was just like that because she's a product of her time great so a racist anti-semitic transphobe is the defining product of this era except that she isn't and we know that she isn't so, like, just consider the next time you feel the urge to say to someone, oh, it's a product of its time in an effort to excuse bad behaviour, just think about how you would like for this time, which is full of the most amazing authors writing the most incredible books, how would you feel if this time was characterised solely by J.K. Rowling? Anyway, A Wizard of Earth Sea was really good. I gave it four stars and very excited to read on for the rest of the series. There were no queer people, but maybe there are in the rest of the series. Maybe there isn't. Even if there's not, it's okay because Ursula K. Le Guin has written queer people in books other than this one. So I'm not going to be mad about it if there are none. If you just want to let me know that you are here and that you made it to the end, leave me... Leave me that emoji of a chick coming out of an egg. Because Easter. And I'll know that you were here. Uh, other than that, I'm definitely going to stop talking now, and I'm never going to mention Dune again. <sighs> and I will see you in my next video. Bye for now.